If you're like me, you can feel a bit overwhelmed to the sheer number of add-ons and extensions available to Blender. It seems that every morning there's a new video on YouTube proclaiming 10 add-ons you probably missed. However, I'm mostly interested in really practical workflow enhancement type of add-ons. For instance, I use one called Synchronize 3D Viewports and another called Edit Instanced Collections, both that I find very valuable workflow enhancements. But in this video, we're going to take a look at two related things. One is a fantastic lighting add-on called Light Wrangler, and the other is to look at lighting in general with an emphasis on using the inverse square falloff function of lights. Light Wrangler is a paid add-on. It's the only one that I use, but once you see how it enhances lighting workflows, you'll see its value. So let's do a quick introduction into what Light Wrangler does produces interactive lighting amongst other things. So if we turn on ray tracing, we have no lights in the scene. I've got a collection that I want the lights to go in. Typically what you would do is you would introduce a light into the scene and then you would begin posing it and working its position and orientations and so forth to get it where you want. But with Light Wrangler, you simply right click on the object, add a light, and then you come in like this and you just put the light where you want it to go on the object. It's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and add one more light. So I'm just going to right click, add another light, and put it basically kind of where I want it to go. Let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the light that Light Wrangler does for you that's actually kind of cool in terms of these area lights. Let me come back to this original one right here. We can preset the size and the distance of the light, which we're going to look at in just a bit. But if I come over here, I'm going to adjust the light size and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger and then I'm going to press tab key. It remembers what mode it's in, which we're going to talk about, but I'm going to bring it down so I can kind of see it painted along the surface like this. What I want to bring your attention to is that the light itself, the reflection of the area light is a little bit more sophisticated than the default behavior. If we come down to the light data properties down in the bottom, there are some light customization options that Light Wrangler provides for us. If we switch back over here to default, you can see how flat Blender's default light behavior is for area lights. It's not very visually appealing. So when we switch back over to Light Wrangler's default, it's much more similar to what you would see in sort of traditional studio photography, which I really, really like. We could also change that by coming over to the horizontal tilt, for instance, and biasing that in one direction or the other. Just right out of the box, area lights are just going to look better when you have Light Wrangler enabled. Finally, we have a few other options. If we come back down to light customization, if we go over to HDRI, we have a bunch of presets that we can use as essentially stencils for the area light. So if we wanted one to look like this kind of photographic studio type of light, or we could try one like this, so we have built in these types of options that we can play with. So let's come over and take a look at two other examples to explore further options of both Light Wrangler and also general light behaviors in Blender, including inverse square fall off, which is a really sort of important concept to understand, both in terms of photography and 3D because we're simulating photography. So let's take a look here how Light Wrangler can light the scene quite easily. The first thing you want to do when you're using Light Wrangler is set up the parameters that it will use to determine the size of the light and the distance of the light from the click point. So I have this ground plane right here. If we look at this, it's basically one meter by one meter. And that gives me a sense for how I want to configure the lights. So before I actually add a light, we come in, right click, come down to preferences. And this is where you would set the initial light distance and the initial light size. We'll just use these. That's three meters. That's pretty far away, but we'll just go ahead and use these as default values. So we'll come in, we're going to add a light, and we can see initial light coming onto the scene. Now, let me press the end key. So this is where you would say maybe three meters is too far. So I wanted to show you that. Let's go ahead and delete that. Let's come back in and let's do the same thing. But this time, now that we have a sense, that maybe 300 centimeters or three meters is too far. Let's just do one meter. 
Now when we come in here, we will add a light. I think that is going to work better. It's probably too large, but that's okay because we can change that. So we'll take that to 50 centimeters or half a meter. Light Wrangler has these three modes. One is designed to generate specularity, specular highlights, and the other is really designed to produce diffuse illumination. So if we look at the camera, we draw a line of sight to the intersection point and draw a line coming out, a normal line, the light is placed on an opposite angle to the incoming line of sight. So that's how the specular mode is designed to place lights. But I think I'd like an emphasis on diffuse illumination as opposed to specularity. So I'm going to press tab key to go back into edit mode. So if we press the three key, we go into diffuse emphasis mode. And that puts the light along a normal at the click point. So when the light is directly above the object, that's going to cast maximum diffuse illumination or an emphasis on diffuse illumination. So let's go for a three point lighting setup here. Let's come over here and let's add another light. We'll just do add light, which is F9. What I want to do is put this emphasis right about there. And then let's put one more at the top. So let's add another light. Now look what happens here. We have this situation where that light is in the background and it is casting a strong reflection on the ground. If you don't want that to happen, move over this backdrop here. And if I press the L key once and then the L key a second time, it automatically puts that ground plane into exclude mode so that the light won't see that to produce illumination onto the ground, only onto the object. So now I can kind of play with this. And I think I like that rim lighting in the back about like that. I think maybe I want to take this down a little bit. So at this scale, seven watts is a fair amount of light energy. Let's take that down to three. And I think that produces a little bit better emphasis. So this is something we're going to talk about a little bit later on in another example, but I'll mention it. The power of the light that we see right here is in watts, but it's not in standard watts that you would think about, say, a 60 watt light bulb, a traditional incandescent light bulb. In that case, most of the energy is being lost to heat and only a small fraction of it is producing the actual illumination. Blender is using a watt in terms of the actual energy that's producing light. And so that's why we see a much smaller value there. But this is also going to be relative to the size of the light and the distance of the light. So the scale of your scene is going to depend very much on how much power you put towards the light. This is a smaller scale scene, so we're using smaller values. As I look at the scene, I think there's a shadow going on over here that I'd maybe like to try and minimize. So let's come back over to the first light that we cast. Note the solid dot there. That indicates that it's in direct mode or diffuse mode, as I call it. So it remembers that. Press the tab key and we can just sort of move this. Now, I actually think that maybe if I move it back here, I kind of like that but it's, it's following the topology. And if you get to a point where you want to fine tune it, where it's not following the topology, we can put it into orbit mode by pressing the two key. And then you're free to just sort of tweak the position like this. And I kind of, I kind of like it about right there. So I minimize that shadow. I've still got good diffuse illumination over here, just a hint of the angle on this object. So, this is what Light Wrangler is so good at, is these nuanced changes, and I did it all here in the 3D viewport, apart from selecting the light, but it's so, so easy to do this. I think the overall coloration is a little antiseptic. All three of our lights are using just a standard RGB white, but if we come down, I've got this light over here selected, you can see that Light Wrangler has added a few options for us. Color temperature is one of them, and this is in Kelvin. So if you've ever used the black body node in the material editor for lights, that's what this does. So if I give this, say, 
4500, that's a warm Kelvin color. That gives us a nice sense of warm over here. But I think for the other two lights, this one, let's go the opposite direction and go to 7500, which is a cool value, but it's going to be more subtle. Let's do the same thing over here. Let's also give this 7500. And that produces these cool tones here and the warmer tones here. And I kind of like that. In this next example, we're going to use this chair to do sort of a studio lighting. So the first thing that we want to do is establish the scale of the scene. The chair is to scale. It's the correct actual physical size. So it's, you know, a good four and a half feet tall. And if I press the N key here, we can see that it's six, almost 6.7 meters for the ground plane. So that's really important for establishing scale. So let's bring up the context menu here, come to preferences, and I want my initial light distance to be about three meters. That's sort of an arbitrary decision, but I think given the scale of my scene, that's going to work as a good starting point. So the first thing that I want to do is come in, note that I have a collection set up to catch my lights as I create them. When we come into render, there's nothing there. So I'm going to generate sort of a basic fill. So add a light. We're going to note that the default energy value is 7 watts. Given the scale of the scene, it's just not producing a lot of light energy. But we'll go ahead and work with this for right now. If you're new to 3D, this is the kind of thing that can really just be frustrating. So there are two things that we could do. We could increase the energy of the light. So in the first part, when we looked at the stapler, the energy values we were using were half of this. They were like 3 watts, and those were producing plenty of energy. And then here, they're not producing hardly any. The amount of energy that we see right there is the total amount of energy leaving the surface area of the area light. So if that area light is quite large, I mean, when we come down here and we, we look, it's one meter by one meter. So it's a big surface area for seven watts to leave. And then it's three meters away from the click point. So not a lot of the energy is actually reaching here. So we're going to come over. Let's just pick an arbitrary value, 32 watts. We certainly could come in and continue to pump up the intensity of the lights. I mean, some lights in very large scale settings are going to be very, very bright. For instance, if you're in a stadium, the lights at a stadium are going to emit a large amount of energy. But in this case, we're in sort of a studio lighting. And so we would also want to consider another thing, and that would be to increase the amount of light reaching the camera sensors. So in traditional photography, they've got three things to work with to increase the exposure. They've got ISO, the aperture, and they've got shutter speed. In Blender, if we come over here to render properties and come down to film, we have a single sort of easy to use exposure value. So in this case, let's take that up to a value of four. And that makes kind of a big difference. I would like my light to maybe be just even a little bit more off to the side. So this is where I would come over, hover over the intersection point, press the tab key, and let's just press the two key so we can manually adjust this. And I want it to kind of be just a little bit more of the side light. So the next thing that we want to do is put a light off onto this side. So let's come over, add a light. In this case, the topology of the chair is going to make the intersection point not super predictable. So we're just going to immediately press 2 so I can manually sort of pull this to the side. Now, one of the cool things that we can do is if I use, if you use the middle mouse button or I'm on a laptop, I can use the trackpad. I can just swipe up to increase the intensity of the light while I'm in this track mode. So I'm going to take this up just a little bit to 33 watts. Arbitrary. I've got sort of a nice rim light. But let's say that I want to see just what this light is adding to the scene. You would press Shift and H, and that isolates just this light in the scene. And now I can see exactly what it's doing for me. And I can adjust that until I get maybe right about there. Click, and it turns the other light back on. 
Let's add one more light to kind of fill out this three-point lighting setup. I think I'd like some light to be on the rim at the top to give a little bit more emphasis. It's a, The lighting is a little bit flat here because of this frontal lighting. So right-click, let's add a light, come up here. Now let's, let's go into isolation mode, Shift H, and then we can kind of see. Again, it's quite dim, so I'm going to increase the lighting like that. And then I'm going to press 2 so that I can manually kind of get that. So I'm getting really nice contrast about like that. I, I think that works pretty well. So I'm going to click and it brings all of them back. And we've got this really nice contrast going on and highlighting. In this example, we used exposure to increase the amount of light that we were seeing. And that really works well. But one of the things that we're noticing is maybe the distribution of light is just a little bit flat. We could take advantage of this inverse square law fall off of lights to tailor the way the light is emphasizing features on the surface. If we take a look at this light, because of its distance, a lot of the light has fallen off by the time it hits the chair, and we've increased its exposure so we can see it better. But a really interesting thing is happening. Near the light, the light is falling off rapidly. But by the time it gets to these farther distances, the fall off is much more shallow. And it's in these much more shallow regions that we're able to use this exposure to pump up the light so that we can see the chair. That works great. It's a good rendering. But there's another way that we could take advantage of this inverse square fall off. So let's take advantage of the inverse square fall off. Let's come over to our sort of key light and let's come back to our focal point here. Press the tab key, hold option, and then let's bring the light in. So it's right very close to the chair itself. Hit return. And now we can see that because we're in this region where the light is rapidly falling off from the source, we're giving a sort of gradient effect to the surface. And that's actually kind of artistically interesting. So let's do this in the opposite way. Let's take this. I, I could use Light Wrangler or we could just press G and then Z. I'll pull this back out to sort of its original distance there where it has much less influence. But we'll take this light in the background and we'll do the same thing. So I'm going to press G and then Z and we'll bring it in close and we'll sort of paint the top of the chair with the bright light and then it's falling off rapidly so we get sort of this nice gradient effect and emphasis of the light. This is just a really nice photographic technique. You can find lots of reference to inverse square law in traditional photography. And because we're putting these lights close into the scene where a lot of their power is, then we don't need to come down and pump up the exposure. In fact, pumping up the exposure in this case would blow the scene out. So it really is just an artistic decision which direction you want to go, placing the lights far, increasing exposure, or lowering the exposure, and moving the lights in, and then playing with inverse square fall-off to sort of apply the light and a gradient across the surface.